For a long period now, we have worked on this problem. We've urged bishops, state presidents, and others to reach out to victims, to comfort them, to strengthen them, to let them know that what happened was wrong, that the experience was not their fault, and that it need never happen again. We've issued publications, established a telephone line where church officers may receive counsel in handling cases, and offered professional help to LDS Family Services. These acts are often criminal in their nature. They are punishable under the law. Professional counselors, including lawyers and social workers, are available on this helpline to advise bishops and state presidents concerning their obligations in these circumstances. I think having the helpline is a terrific idea, given that bishops and state presidents are rarely professionally trained psychologists or social workers, and they are certainly not given any training by the church to handle such matters. However, as has been shown repeatedly over the years, especially in the last week, the helpline goes directly to the law firm retained by the church, Curtin McConkie, and time and again, bishops are told to bury the matter and keep it hidden. We desire to help both the victim and the offender. Our hearts reach out to the victim and we must act to assist him or her. Our hearts reach out to the offender, but we cannot tolerate the sin of which he may be guilty. Where there has been offense, there is a penalty. The process of the civil law will work its way, and the ecclesiastical process will work its way, often resulting in excommunication. This is both a delicate and a serious matter. Nevertheless, we recognize, and must always recognize, that when the penalty has been paid and the demands of justice have been met, there will be a helpful and kindly hand reaching out to assist. There may be continuing restrictions, but there will also be kindness. I wish the church truly would not tolerate the abuser and his sin. Child abuse is going to occur in any group or society. It just will. If the church truly did not tolerate these despicable actions, they would go out of their way to see that the abuse is reported to civil authorities each and every time. Reporting laws be damned. They would publicize who the offender is and the nature of his crimes and warn parents of their wards and stakes to keep their children away from these monsters. If you ask me, it would be much better for the reputation of the church if they'd go out of their way to see that these people are prosecuted and punished to the fullest extent of the law and to truly protect children in their charge. But they have chosen over and over to try to protect their precious reputation by further victimizing these precious children. It is noble to want to help the offender, but not at the expense of protecting the children. If the first responsibility is to protect the victims of abuse, spare no expense and use every resource to get these children to the services that will help them to heal from the traumas of their horrendous ordeals. The church's standards should be higher than whatever the law does or does not require. All lay clergy should be mandatory reporters, and it should say so in the church's handbook of instructions. But in their actions to silence the victims, protect the offenders, allowing them to continue their abuse, and protect the good name and reputation of the church, they have proven that they are not led by Jesus Christ. They are not the one true church. They are a corporation hell-bent on protecting their money hoard at all costs.